Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for May 21st, 2018. It's Monday, and typically at this time that we record this podcast, there isn't a lot of uh, discussion-worthy news out there. So we are experimenting with a new format. Instead of doing uh, a random water cooler segment throughout the week, uh, we're going to try to do uh, – we're going to turn Mondays into water cooler Mondays. Uh, and bring the whole team on to discuss what they've been up to and what they've been watching. This is Slash Home Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Home Managing Editor Jacob Paul. Hello, hello. A weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writers Y Tran Bowie. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Okay, guys, um, let's get into it uh, and t- talk about what we've been up to. Uh, last night, I went to Save by the Max, which is uh, a Save by the Bell themed pop up restaurant. Um, are any of you guys uh, big fans of Save by the Bell? I've I'm... never seen a single episode. <laughs> wow, what? <laughs> I think are I was you too serious? Young. I think I was too young to watch it. Oh my god! I watched like every episode growing up, but I haven't revisited the show, you know, since I was like fifteen or something. And this is where I think Chris, Ben, Brad, and Peter are all a little bit older than me, and a lot older than HG. So the timeline does check out. Not that much older. Okay, yeah. The Saved by the Bell was uh, ended when I was born. It ended in ninety (laughs) two. Oh wow. Okay, I feel old. Uh, Chris, how about you? I have never seen it. No, what? I've never watched oh it. Oh my though. god, you guys are killing me! What is happening, Brad? My my Brad. wife has oh, seen god. it. I can I can call her up and get her on right now. <laughs> she's, she's seen every single episode. So. Okay, for those who have who have not seen Save the Bell, it started a Saturday morning, like teen high school kind of drama, uh, almost like nine hundred two one zero, but like uh, a little bit more tame, I guess. Um, and, um, it, it t- turned into kind of a big hit. Uh, it had some, uh, they actually remade it a couple times, I think, too. Uh, anyways, uh, you know, it's a big thing. A lot of people, you know, that have nostalgia for the, the late 80s and early 90s, uh, you know, loved Save by the Bell. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of these pop up restaurants going around, but this is actually one that's like licensed by, uh, by the you know creators and it, it's kind of cool because in hollywood they have transformed this restaurant space into the max which is like the the um cafe that uh you know that they used to hang out outside of school um and it, it is a faithful recreation of that set it, it looks so good um it, it's also like i think part of this trend of uh of having places open up like these uh, uh limited time places opening up that are basically just instagram spots you know it's just an excuse for you to go there and get some photos for your social media accounts um th- this place uh you have to buy tickets well in advance it was 40 dollars a person that included a dinner and i mean an entree and an appetizer and i think like the first day they went on sale they sold out for like months i think like the last date is in August. They might extend it. I'm sure they're going to extend it because, like, you know, it, it's insanely popular. Uh, but uh, it, it is very cool. You could walk throughout the – it wasn't too crowded. You could walk and take pictures throughout the location, tons of photo spots. You could go into Belding's office. Like, there, there's, like, just little cool details, like the um, – the payphone on the wall next to the, the, the entrance door had, like, that – um that suicide helpline that they called in that one episode, like, like little, like cool little, um, details, Easter eggs. Yeah. Easter eggs for fans. And, um, I think fans will get a kick out of this. The food was, was pretty bad. I think, uh, most of the, um, I've gone to a couple of these kind of like pop-ups. Like I, I did the Beetlejuice one that is currently in LA. And I think there's one in, I think they do it in New York city as well. And, uh, the food there is not great as well, but I don't think you're there for the food. I think you're there, uh, for the experience. And, uh, I, I recommend the experience. So if you're in LA and, uh, actually it's sold out, so you can't go to it. But when, when they release new tickets, <laughs> which I'm sure they will, because this has been insanely popular, um, I would highly recommend, uh, checking it out. Um, but, uh, what else have I been up to? Uh, 
my girlfriend Kitra has been away for two weeks. Uh, her mom has been sick, so she's been with her mom. She came back uh, this weekend, and uh, and I, I watched Cobra Kai for. I want to say two. Uh, it wasn't a third time. I've, I've watched before she came home. I had watched it one and a half times. So I made. So I guess I've watched it two and a half times at this point. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot. Wow, do you even like this show, Peter? <laughs> this is peak TV. There's a ton of things I could be watching, not just for my enjoyment, but also for work. But I've watched this show almost three times. I've, I've I enjoy it so many so much. Uh, my girlfriend Kitra did not grow up with Karate Kid. I showed it to her like maybe a year ago. She liked it, didn't love it, didn't want to see the series. I uh, you know forced her against her will to watch Cobra Kai. <laughs> And, like a uh, good boyfriend. Yeah, good boyfriend. <laughs> yes. Welcome home. Sit down. I'm getting play. <laughs> uh, and um, I think by the fourth episode, she like loved it. By the end of it, she was like, "I can't wait for season two. Uh, so I just want to say, you know, if you you are out there and uh, I don't know, if you're listening to this podcast, you already know that I like this show. Uh, I think it takes a few episodes to get really going, but it, it's it's just so enjoyable. Uh, have any of you caught Cobra Kai yet? No, I've been watching ER on Hulu. I'm sorry, Peter. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll talk about that in a few moments. Um, <laughs> what else have I been up to? Oh, I, uh, we caught up on Survivor Ghost Island, uh, which is the current season of Survivor, which is uh, not as great as previous seasons, but it's enjoyable. Um, and, uh, oh, went to Century City. Uh, do you guys know what Halo Top ice cream is? Yes. Yes, it is. it is awesome. Because it's ice cream that you can it's enjoy. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. You are insane. <laughs> yeah, the, ca- the calorie count is low, but the taste is nowhere near as good as real ice cream. And so it's just, it is it is what it is. I don't know. I don't taste the difference between Halo Top and real ice cream. Well, your your mouth, the diff- your mouth what is, is the difference? Yeah, Halo, what is it? Halo, Halo, uh, like a, an entire pint of Halo Top ice cream is like 300 calories. Whereas, so like, it, a normal Ben & Jerry's is, like, in the thousands. So it's, like, uh, um, for they have, they serving... Have, they have for, tons of different flavors, and the calorie count is extremely low, so you don't have to feel awful when you eat a whole pint. <laughs> yeah, I, I like Halo Top. Uh, after you've been on a diet for a week or two, you, you need something desperately, and you go eat it and go, wow, this is really good. This is real ice cream. So it's really good diet ice cream after you've been adjusted to, be, to your suffering. But I, I really don't enjoy it like outside of that situation, though. But I didn't know they had. I didn't know they had stores, though. Peter, what's it like to actually go and get from a, from a shop? Yes. Yeah, so they've recently started opening up uh, these uh, scoop shops. I think they're called Halo Top Scoop Shops. Uh, I went to the second one ever. It, it's in Century City's uh, Westfield Mall, and it is. Um, I mean, it's basically what it sounds like. It's it's, it's an ice cream shop, uh, but um, it's it's actually a lot. Um, I'm not sure if the ice cream's different than what you get in the pints. It tasted a lot different. It tasted more. Um, it was more. It was softer and more like real ice cream. I feel like the the only thing that's bad about Halo Top ice cream is it's sometimes like kind of like more like harder than traditional ice cream. Um, yeah, you're supposed to like leave it out for a couple minutes before you eat it if you have it in the freezer. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. It, 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 me having a scoop of uh, salted caramel ice cream in a waffle cone and it being under 300 calories was awesome. <laughs> um, not that I'm, on, I'm currently on a diet, but uh, I don't know. I, I just think that the, the, that is cool that we live in a world where there is an ice cream shop where you can you know eat at it without feeling totally horrible about your uh, your choice. Um, but it's like the impossible burger, the one that's made out of, um, that's made to taste and bleed like meat, but it's made out of vegetables. <laughs> it's wait, they make it bleed like meat. Yeah. It's some sort of, um, enzyme that they've been able to tap so that when you eat it, it looks and feels like real meat, but it's not crazy. Have any of you had this impossible, impossible burger? No, no. cause I'm an adult and I'm not going to ruin my burgers. <laughs> Apparently, it tastes really good. People they do all those videos on YouTube where they're like, "Taste these burgers," and they're like, "Which one is the real burger?" And people can't tell. See, oh, also, as much <laughs> once, they can, once they can grow a, a cow in a lab, like grow the meat in a, in a test tube, and it's actual meat, but it's not actually slaughtered. Then I'll become Mister Quasi Vegetarian. But until then, keep your fake burgers. <laughs> 
I don't know. Now I w- I'm very curious. I want to try this out. Uh, but actually, let, let's go over to Ben. Ben, what have you been up to? Uh, I went to a place in North Hollywood called the Iliad Bookshop, and um, I've sort of been bouncing around to a, a couple different used book uh, bookstores lately. There's one in downtown L.A., uh, called the Last Bookstore, which is really great, and it's also very um, sort of Instagram friendly. As Peter was mentioning earlier, uh, there's all sorts of like um, cool little uh, like they have books that are elaborately organized to basically work as photo ops for you to take pictures in front of them. Peter, have you ever been there at the Last Bookstore? Yes, it's almost like a, there's like this whole tunnel of books that like, right. kind of like over are kind of like a uh, I guess like a rainbow. Yeah, walk yeah, through, exactly. yeah, I've seen pictures of that on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. Um, but yeah, the Iliad is in North Hollywood, uh, as opposed to um, the last bookstore being in downtown LA. And it's much more of like a homegrown kind of place. Um, the last bookstore is like this huge cavernous uh, area. I don't know what the square footage is, but it's absolutely massive. It's got two stories. It's like this huge, I mean, you could spend an entire day in there, uh, even more so than in any traditional bookstore. But this, uh, the Iliad, is much more traditional. And it's great because they have cats wandering around <laughs> in the whole thing. That's like part of the appeal of it um, is that they just have like a, a couple cats that I think their their cats' names are Zeus and Apollo. So it, it's all sort of going in with this Greek mythology vibe. But um, but yeah, the place is pretty cool. And the prices are a lot better at the Iliad than they are at uh, the last bookstore. So if anybody's in L.A. and interested in uh, used books or or uh, otherwise, you know, becoming literate and, and uh, looking for new stuff. That's the place to go. I think um, I got a bunch of different books. Um, the most, I guess, the the most prominent one that I'm really looking forward to reading is The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, which I've heard a lot of good things about and uh, have not actually had a chance to read yet. I I had been hearing good things about this book for a long time and just realized that it came out like. 15 years ago um i didn't realize it was that old but have any of you read that book uh, michael shaban 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 yeah i i have it's fantastic it's you're gonna it's a great book because it's a really solid drama about lots of things about growing up in, um, in america as an immigrant about other subjects that i want to spoil but it's also a really great history of the early comic book uh, era because the main characters are all working in comic books in the 30s to the 50s so uh, you're actually getting a really good uh quick education of that era while you're reading a really compelling uh drama it's a really good book cool yeah my wife and i got a a big stack of books and then actually um just i think it was yesterday we were walking through our neighborhood and saw that there was a yard sale going on and there were a bunch of really nice leather bound books in a, a crate or a couple different boxes and this person was like who was selling this stuff was like yeah i want to keep all of these books together and sell them as one sort of package and we just decided to go ahead and we spent probably a little uh, I mean it wasn't that much it was like three dollars a book so um it was pretty good for the amount of books we got which was a lot but um there I mean we have these stacks and stacks and stacks of books now because we just took all of these boxes with us and got like you know a bunch of classics that are leather bound and hard cover and like really nice they're gonna look awesome on a bookshelf when we eventually get a house one day um so I'm excited about that and having these classics you know, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Three Musketeers and stuff that I've never actually got around to sitting down and reading before. So I'm looking forward to uh, to getting around to that. I'm so jealous that you actually have the time to read books. I, I feel like there's this one magic book that I've been trying to get through and I've I probably have spent like the last two months trying to get through it. It's not that not even that big. Um, it, See, it, Peter, it's it's really easy though. All you have to do is not watch Cobra Kai two and a half times. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I should also mention that uh, uh, yard sales in Hollywood during the summer are awesome. Uh, there's like this one famous one that's like on like Santa Monica near like La Brea that I, I have gone to numerous times where they like whoever has the yard sale like must have been in film publicity or was a film journalist and they just have like tons of like old press notes from like films and like like you know uh, not just press swag notes, but, yeah, and, swag, and, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah cool yeah, so you come across all that kind of co- cool stuff uh, but uh, J- Jacob you've also been reading some stuff. I, I just finished reading uh, The Big Picture, a book that we reviewed on the site that Chris reviewed for us about the current state of Hollywood. And it's a fantastic read. And uh, you can read his review and put in the show notes if you want to know more. But it's like this really, really in-depth 
uh, look at um, streaming China, Amazon, Netflix, superhero movies, franchises, all the buzzwords, all the big stuff, and how it came to be. And I just finished that. And it, as is my way, I finish one book and I go buy 20 more because I um. Wait, wait a second. Like Before you get to the 20 more, uh, what do you think the biggest takeaway for you as someone who follows this industry very closely, something that you didn't know or didn't like, uh, you know, weren't really that well aware of coming out of this book, do you think? Uh, I don't want to say I wasn't aware of this, but I want to say it was painted in a way I found really interesting and fascinating, which is that um, while there are some studio execs like Amy Pascal who were built on having really good taste and, and gut instincts for good movies while they're falling by the wayside, there is this new generation of um, producers and writers uh, highlighted in the book. Uh, Simon Kinberg of the X-Men franchise is one guy who gets his own chapter practically of people who are saying, okay, this is the current state of Hollywood. Um, how do I work within franchises and still be me? How do I, how do I make the movies I want to make while also um, making sure I can keep working? And, I know some people are going to see that and be kind of grossed out by it because it's, like it's pretty much artist time saying, okay, I'm going to bow to the studio system and do what I got to do to keep working, if, even if it means making X-Men movies forever. Uh, but <laughs> he, he's, he's hearing these writers and producers talk about how this is my reality, I'm going to make the art I want to make, and I'm going to run my company and do everything in my power, in my creative power, to keep myself fresh, to keep my creative juices flowing, while also doing what, what works – was interesting and something I think we're going to see a lot more of as as a lot of Hollywood's old guard starts to try to adjust to this new system and realize, okay, can we still make movies and make us passionate while making the thing the decision that Disney does? Yeah. And I don't know if the answer is yes, but I'm interested to see what happens and having that illuminated um, in the book, which it comes late in the book. The book is so front loaded with bad feelings at the end. <laughs> it's like here's a, here, here's some stories about people who are making it work, and I found that. A, light, a, a ray of sunshine. The book is otherwise pretty bleak. Yeah, my, my, I think my favorite chapter in the book is the kind of the the rise of Marvel Studios and uh, kind of the, the idea of cinematic universes. And uh, there's there's a scene that it paints of Amy Pascal, the then head of Sony Pictures, who uh, is I think having lunch at the time, and Kevin Kevin Feige coming in for a meeting and uh, pitching her the idea of them working together on a Spider-Man movie that, you know, Marvel Studios would produce themselves. And Amy Pascal throws her sandwich in in Kevin Feige's face, um, which is just uh, great. But anyways, there, there's a lot of good <laughs> info in there. Uh, what, what other books have uh, have you moved on to? I just started reading uh, Dave Itzkoff's um, Robin Williams biography. Not far enough to have a uh, firm opinion on it yet, uh, but... Like uh, Ben, I visited bookshops, used bookstores uh, over the weekend. Uh, my wife was out of town on vacation with my mom. And all, all the girls in my family all get together every week or every year for a big vacation. So I was all alone. And I went I, I went all around uh, the city, hit up six used bookstores, and bought probably close to 50 books. <laughs> um, and it was... It, it was a thing. Wait, it, wait, it was wait, wait, give me an idea here. Like, How much does like 50 used books cost in Austin, Texas? Okay, uh, to clarify, I was I was house sitting. Okay, I'm gonna back up because I'm looking at my list of things I want to talk about. I was in San Antonio babysitting my mom's dogs. She has f- three dogs. I have two. So I was in the city of San Antonio, where where I am every few months is out of my family, uh, and I was watching two ta- three terriers and two basset hounds, and they're a handful and they're a nightmare, and I love them so much. Uh, and one day I said, you know what? I'm going to take a break from the dogs and I'm going to go do a tour of all San Antonio's bookstores. So I got I mapped out a route. Most of these stores I've been to before, but I've never done them all at once before. And I did, I, knowing that I, this was actually my, my, my sneaky uh, advice for, um, for people who want to do bookstores is wait until your, your partner or spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend or what have you is on a vacation that's being paid for by somebody else. So they won't miss some extra money being spent when you blow it on too many books. Uh, but to answer your, your question more specifically, um, I just tend to be—I tend to keep my, my pulse on what I want from a, from a bookstore run. I know the prices of things generally. I'll have Amazon, eBay, I'm ready on my phone to compare prices. If a book is more than half the cost of what it is retail new, I won't buy it. Uh, a lot of bookstores will have dollar sections where you can buy books for a dollar each, and. My, I have a compulsion for buying books. Uh, one of these days, I'll 
I'll take a picture of my personal libraries. That's libraries plural in my house for the thousands of books uh, I've been buying uh, over the past decade plus in my life. And so like, it's a case how, where how many of which have you read? Uh, I'd say I have about a 50 percent ratio. Um, but it's a conversation I have with my wife. Um, the reason why she's OK with me spending money in books, the reason why I feel good about it is because there have been multiple occasions where I'll be at work or I'll be having a conversation. So they will come up and I'll say, oh, wait a second. I'll run to the book shelf in whatever room has that subject because all, all my books are divided by the genre based in the room and i'll pull it down and we'll suddenly have something to talk about something i can use our conversation or like i'll be writing an article at work and then i can google something i'm not getting a great answer i remember oh the roger ebert reviewed this in one of his books so i'll go to my roger ebert shelf because i have a roger ebert shelf and i'll pull down his books and i find the quote i wanted to find and then i can uh use that quote and also um we've turned the books into an aesthetic where when you walk into our house, um, everywhere you look, there are bookshelves, and we make them look nice. They're organized neatly. Uh, they're organized by type and genre, uh, hardcovers and paperbacks. Uh, and it's a case where... Wait, but you haven't, com- you haven't done the modern Instagram thing of, of doing it color-coded. Ew, 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 no, <laughs> ew. I, I, we, we, we like to the, we, we like the look like a controlled chaos. Like We look at a shelf, and it's just like, okay, what is this? They're all the same subject. Um, but like, okay, this shelf is movies, this shelf is comics, this shelf is Hollywood biographies, this shelf is um, original paperbacks from the 60s of 1960s sci-fi short stories. So it, it's, it's a case where every single room is a conversation starter, every single wall uh, is built around these books. These books fill in gaps, they make the room look nice, and we have guests over, a guest will pull something off the shelf and say, what's this? And I say, oh, that's so-and-so. And it's become what our house is built around. Some people, you know, build around furniture or... Yeah, I know, I, I know oh, Brad it's... like has his like whole movie wall of uh, Blu-rays. Yeah, and my, my Blu-rays live upstairs now, and that's fine. Um, it's a case where I know some people are probably like rolling their eyes really hard at, at buying books for decoration purposes, but I buy them for decoration and because I love them. I, I buy too many and I I make use of them. I'm plowing my way through my books as not at the rate I can, but it's it's, an, it's such a nice feeling. You know that should I, should I ever have a family? Uh, should I ever have children? They'll grow up in a house full of books, and knowing that if I ever have a kid who says, I want to read this book, I can take him to the, to the room where that book is and pull it down, makes me happy in a way that I have a hard time selling that without sounding cheesy. Uh, I don't know if I ever will be a father, uh, but <laughs> it's a case where knowing that that's, that's my father fantasy. It's not miracle yeah. of life. It's I'm going to teach my kids to read good things. And, and these theoretical children one day will still be being seen, seeing uh, Twitter replies from your Star Wars Last Jedi tweets over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, yeah, I, what happened? Okay. I When I tweet, I, I don't have an, an agenda when I tweet. I just tweet out the things that are on my mind. And I mean, if some people like it or respond to it, great. That's, that's fine. But what I want to expect is to have like 8,000 people literally interact with a tweet about Star Wars, specifically one where I say that in 20 years, I think The Last Jedi will be seen as the best movie in the entire series, which this thing I threw out there, because I, I, I do believe that. <laughs> I, I do think it's, over the past six months, it's become a favorite Star Wars movie, and I was not expecting it to be retweeted by many, many people and to be responded by many, many people, and for me to spend most of my weekend ignoring or to or engaging those responses. It was such a wild thing um, to see the, the wars erupt in my Twitter mentions. And it was just, it, it, it veered widely between unpleasant and kind of amusing. And what I've learned is that I'm just not going to tweet about Star Wars anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm done for a while. Yeah. When, when you but tweet I, about uh, Star Wars, the wars come to you. Yeah. I guess my whole conclusion is, and some people took this really the wrong way on Twitter. I did not mean for that, uh, which is that, like, for you, you, Peter, for example, you love Star Wars. Star Wars is one of your favorite things in the world. But you're also a movie fan. You watch lots and lots of movies. You ha- you are trained and educated in how to watch movies and how to absorb movies. I think everybody on this podcast is, and a lot of people listening to this is. But there are people out there who they just like Star Wars. They don't watch other movies. They don't read other books. Uh, they don't absorb other things. So I, I don't know. Was something like The Last Jedi comes around, and it's being so different. I feel like the criticisms are not something that are fair, like your, like yours are, Peter. You've had very fair criticisms of Last Jedi. The criticisms come from the place of somebody who has never ventured outside of Star Wars, who has no knowledge um, or care to not or care to gain knowledge from larger film, larger literature, larger art. And my hyper pretentious re- example was that when I went to college in pursuit of a film degree, 
Before I even touched the camera, I had to take sculpting classes. I had to take painting classes. I had to take art history classes. And while it was frustrating in the moment, like, why, when am I going to touch the camera? When am I going to write a screenplay? Ultimately, when it came time to actually talk about movies and make movies, uh, I was so much better equipped to do it. So I guess my thing is, if you don't like, if you don't like Last Jedi, that really is okay. It, we, we can have that conversation. But I really do wish that there was this segment of Star Wars fans who, who have such a pitiful and pe- uh, pity, uh, pethy things to respond would uh, maybe this venture outside of Star Wars is a little bit. That's my personal opinion, and, and that's really horrible, and it sounds awful, and I can hear Peter groaning right now. I'm not groaning, it's just I, I can picture those people, if they were listening to this podcast, they probably aren't, because they, you know, probably uh, found your tweet through a hashtag or someone retweeting it, but if they're listening right now, I don't think this would be helping <laughs> any of the matters <laughs> any. Um, but we should probably move on to HT. Um, HT, you were in Montreal this weekend. Yes, I was he- in Montreal for the weekend because uh, my little sister just got accepted to grad school there at McGill. So my sister and my mom and I went up for the weekend to sort of uh, scope out where she would like to live and stuff. And it was also my sister and my mom's birthdays. They both are born like a day apart from each other. So uh, we kind of used that excuse to do a little trip uh, across the border to Canada. And it was really fun. I, I it was my first, no, it's my second time in Montreal, but I haven't been there since I was really young, so I didn't remember much of it. Uh, but it was, we were blessed with a sunny day. It was gorgeous. We ate a lot of good food. We ate at this um, one Michelin star restaurant named Toke, and uh, it was the most delicious Arctic char I ever had. So that was really fun. Um, I didn't really do anything pop culture related, although I did see a Leonard Cohen mural. Oh no! Actually, one one pop culture thing I did see was a a guy in the park uh, playing "My Heart Will Go On" by Celine Dion on bagpipes, and I was <laughs> like, "That's a very Canada thing to happen." Yes. <laughs> so yeah, it was fun. I probably will end up going back again a, a few more times because my sister will be there for the next couple of years. So maybe the first of many jaunts over to Montreal. Um, and um, another thing I did over the weekend was, uh, well, this was actually earlier last week, um, and this was kind of a movie I watched in anticipation of a column I do every other week called Pop Culture Imports, in which I highlight uh, foreign films and foreign TV shows that are streaming. And this was a, a really exciting sort of movie for me to watch because uh, I, it's by one of my favorite directors ever. So uh, The Castle of Cagliostro, uh, which is Hayao Miyazaki's feature film debut, it's his directorial debut, uh, is now streaming on Netflix. And this is a movie I've been looking for uh, for years now, ever since I became a Miyazaki fan when I was little. And I remember when I was young, I like hunted down all of the Miyazaki movies I could find on DVD. And this was one that I could not find because... Um, Lupin the Third, colon, the, ca- the Castle of Cag- Cagliostro, was a movie that he made uh, before Studio Ghibli was founded. So this is his first movie ever. This is before he became a really big name. And um, it was directed, he, it was released in 1979. And it's actually both a sequel and an adaptation of a manga. So you would be, you wouldn't, you kind of expect like, oh, you need to watch things and know what Lupin the Third is before going into it. But it's really just a, like when you watch it, it's really clear that it's a very Miyazaki film. Uh, watching it for the first time was just a really cool experience for me as a Miyazaki fan and seeing sort of like the style that he would later establish in later films and also the sort of character types that he really loves to come back to and that sort of um, sort of dreamlike depiction of European architecture and fantasy that he would often return to as well. Uh, there's a Japanese term for it, actually. Uh, it was called... Uh, Akogare no Paris, which means in Japanese, the Paris of our dreams. And it's sort of uh, aesthetic, which is a fantastical view of Europe through Eastern eyes. And that's something that he often comes back to. And it's something that he kind of first establishes in the castle of Cagliostro. It's just a really cool film. It's actually, it's a great film in and of itself. Um, it's about this uh, master thief named Lupin III, who uh, it decides to take on this count who rules this small country and uh, kidna- and 
rescue the princess who is being forced into marriage with this evil count. And there's shades of his movies like Castle in the Sky, Nausicaa, the Valley of the Wind, uh, even movies like Porco Rosso in this in this film. And it's really exciting to see um, him kind of, I don't want to say recycle it, but just use that as a jumping off point for his later films. Uh, it's it's really fun. I, mean, I, uh, I our, our greatest, it. like our favorite filmmakers of all time, I think, seem to gravitate to the same themes and character archetypes and stuff like mm-hmm. you, you 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 tend to see like a lot of that kind of like shades of their earlier work reappear in their later films exactly yeah so if you're a fan of miyazaki i highly recommend going to see this now it's now streaming on netflix uh a fun fact well it's not really a fact it's more of a, a common rumor that goes around is that the chase scene in the beginning of this film uh, inspired Steven Spielberg uh, in some capacity. Um, He was so impressed by it that he apparently used it in his uh, Indiana Jones films and Adventures of Tintin film. That's just kind of a rumor. I don't really know if that's a thing, but it's in the Wikipedia article and he apparently loves this film and on the DVD it quotes him as Yes, exactly. And on the DVD for this uh, movie, it quotes Steven Spielberg as saying, it's one of the greatest adventure movies of all time. Uh, there's no evidence of him quoting this at all, but, you know, that's one thing if you want, if you want a, another reason to dive into this movie. I'm, I'm going to have to check this out. Uh, you know, you guys make fun of me rewatching Cobra Kai, you know, two, three times, but Brad has been on a rewatching spree. Brad, what have you been rewatching this week? Ooh, I've been watching everything over and over again. Um, <clears throat> no, I uh, I went back to the theater uh, recently to go see Avengers Infinity War for a third time because it's been a few weeks since I had I've been away from the hype and kind of died down. The theaters weren't as crowded, and so I kind of wanted to go back and give myself another shot at it. I've been wanting to see it again. Um, and it's just it's just so good. It's so good. Um, it is, it is paced perfectly. It, it never drags, you know, even for being as long as it is. And it really is just this incredible achievement in blockbuster filmmaking, serial storytelling. You know, no one's ever done anything on this scale before and done so with such success. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just in awe of how cool it is that we get a movie like this that, you know, is bringing such a huge epic scale comic book story to life in a way that is so satisfying for, for so many people. It was just, there's moments that are still breathtaking in it, even though you know what's coming. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just a great movie that is, that is full of just movie magic, pure movie magic. But you're not just rewatching movies in the theater. You're rewatching TV shows instead of seeing new TV shows like Cobra Kai, uh, Brad, you're rewatching old TV shows. Well, let me be clear. uh, Let me be clear because when I work, uh, when I'm writing articles for SlashFilm.com, um, I put on stuff in the background that I've already seen. Because if I put on stuff in the background that I haven't seen, I get distracted or I feel like I'm not paying close enough attention to it and I miss something that's going on and I'm not giving it its due diligence. So I always put on stuff in the background that I've already seen before. And one of my favorite shows of all time, probably my favorite comedy series of all time, is NBC's 30 Rock. And so this is probably like, I think the third or fourth time that I've rewatched the series in its entirety. I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, season four right now, I think. And it's just, it's, it's nice to have it on the background because I know what's happening. I like, I, but I still keep catching jokes every now in the background. And this show ha- just consistently makes me laugh out loud all the time. It's, it's so fast and sharp and funny. You know, even some of the, like the dated pop culture references still make me laugh because I remember what was going on at that time and why it was relevant. Um, the whole cast is great. Like it's it's definitely one of the best comedies that's ever been made. And it's 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 so funny. I, and I love rewatching it every single time. Um, so this is why, you know, when you read uh, Ethan Anderson's uh, posts on Slash dot com, you see random 30 rock quotes just randomly inserted throughout the the post right did, did you say ethan anderson who is that anderton sorry oh weird um yeah that's why i just I, I automatically throw in the things like there about living every week like it's shark week and i always <laughs> reference my friend arsenio billingham uh, uh, brad i just realized something is your pen name based off of two tom cruise characters <laughs> yeah i <laughs> I, I explained this once on when I was uh, a guest for the first time on Slash Filmcast. 
And it, honestly, it was never intended to just be like me combining the names of two Tom Cruise characters. But I always liked the, those names individually. Ethan, I liked, you know, as a name, regardless of being tied to Mission Impossible. And Anderton, I liked because of Minority Report. But in my mind, I was never like, ooh, I'm going to make a Tom Cruise pseudonym. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you also tried uh, some new Oreo flavors this weekend. I, I did as well. Uh, which ones did you oh. try? Uh, so, yeah, there's they released a, a, a batch of three new flavors as part of this, like, it's hashtag my Oreo creation. I guess uh, people like suggested flavors that Oreo make, uh, and they picked. They were voting, and they picked which ones were going to get made, or something like that. And so they released an Oreo thins flavor that's pina colada, um, a, a a golden Oreo flavor that is kettle corn, and a regular Oreo flavor that is cherry cola. And I I, I found all three of them in the store recently, and I finally got around to trying them. And, and what, what did you think? Um, they're, I mean, they're not they're not bad. Um, I think probably the most disappointing wor- one is the cherry cola one, just because it's so odd. Like it doesn't. I don't think that the so the the filling is part of it is red and part of it is white, and it it, it tastes like uh, like artificial cherry cola. And then there's pop rocks inside the frosting as well. And so it's it definitely has a taste, but it, the the cream itself uh, tasting like cherry cola doesn't feel like it blends too well with the taste of the chocolate cookie of the traditional Oreo. So it's kind of weird. Yeah, I agree. I, and they've done the pop rocks thing before with uh, what was it, fireworks or firecracker Oreos, which yeah, I much prefer. Yeah, and those those are it looks it seems like those are coming back every summer now because those are starting to hit shelves again. The, that's just a regular Oreo that has pop rocks in the the white filling. So. Those are they're, they're you mean they're they're I think they're more fun for kids than they are for adults just because you know kids like opening their mouth when there's pop rocks in there and feeling and hearing the crackle of the candy. Brad, I like opening my mouth with uh, <laughs> pop rocks and the crackle of the candy. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on to Chris because we are running a little late here. Uh, this is the first time us doing this, and I didn't know how long it was going to take us to all do our water cooler entries. The answer is a really long time. Um, let's get to Chris. Chris has seen, he's the only one who's actually seen a lot of new movies, uh, this week. Chris, what have you been up to? Well, they're, they're new to me. Um, I finally went and saw A Quiet Place. I've been waiting because, uh, people who go to the movies around me are loud and they can't keep their mouths closed. And this, you know, the entire thing with A Quiet Place is it's all about, being quiet and you know, there's barely any spoken dialogue it's all uh, american sign language subtitled so i really wanted to see this movie but i was dreading seeing it with a normal crowd because i knew they wouldn't be able to shut their damn mouths so uh, i waited about you know a few weeks i finally went and saw it and as i went to the theater uh there were already like three or four people in there and my heart sank because i said damn it i this i guess i didn't wait long enough but they were fine. The the few people there were fine, and the movie was great. It lived up to the hype. Um, I'm very impressed with John Krasinski. I had no idea he could actually make a, a movie this good and this you know well crafted. And uh, you know, not only is it is it great at building tension, there's also some surprisingly emotional moments that really got me that I wasn't expecting. So, uh, I, I, it was worth the wait. I'm glad I went and saw it. Um, uh, I also watched Game Night, the the comedy that came out a little earlier uh, that's coming on Blu-ray this week, actually. So I, I watched that, and that was a lot of fun. It was um, – I feel like a lot of modern comedies, they're shot in a really bland sort of point-and-shoot way. And this movie, not only is it funny, but it's, it's really well-directed. There's a great style to it that I wasn't expecting. And uh, uh, There's a fantastic uh, quote-unquote one-shot in this movie that I actually think is even better than Coogler's one-shot in, in Black Panther. I think it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's Yeah, it's very well made. I, I was not expecting this to be as, as stylish as it was, so that, that really impressed me. And uh, finally, I also watched um, this, this upcoming movie called Hearts Beat Loud with Nick Offerman, and uh, I think it played at Sundance. We have a review of it. Uh, it was good. It's um, It has a lot of indie movie cliches to it, but it's such a heartfelt movie that you, you can sort of forgive how generic it is sometimes and you know you get on board with how you know it, it, it's it's a it's kind of a melancholy movie which i wasn't expecting because a lot of the 
the pull quotes call it a feel good movie, which I don't think it really was because it's kind of down. It's kind of downbeat, but uh, everyone in it is very good, and the soundtrack is great. So uh, I enjoyed it. So Quiet Place is in theaters. A Game Night is coming out on Blu-ray. Where can people see Heart Hearts Beat Loud? Uh, I don't think it's out yet. It's coming out, I believe, this month. Very cool. Uh, I'm not going to make everybody do their outros because that would take 10 minutes. But you you can find all of our work on SlashFilm.com. SlashFilm Daily is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please, uh, if you listen to this podcast, which... I'm sure if you got to this point, you have listened to this full podcast. Uh, send us your feedback at peter at slash I'm wondering what you think of uh, this idea of doing a water cooler Monday every Monday. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, leave a little bit of both. Peter at slash film, uh, at slash And uh, please go rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow.